Hi, Belinda. Thank you so much for coming on today. Hi, Cora. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so thrilled. And it's, um, you know, we're kind of, we're kicking off a month of really talking about all the aspects of clean beauty. I think this is a phrase that's getting so much airtime at the moment, but really we still have a lot of questions about, and I, I myself have learned so much in the last kind of couple of years that I really wanted to talk to different experts and arenas about, you know, different things that we'd like to be doing more sustainably, more organically, et cetera, et cetera. But today we're going to talk about perfume and fragrances, which on one hand is such a beautiful industry that is so rife <laughs> with so many problems um, that you might not expect. And I really think it's so important, particularly, well, you know what, actually, not just for women, but for any of the men listening too, because these are things that we're putting on ourselves all the time thinking that, you know, we're doing something lovely, we're gonna smell great, this is a beautiful sort of ritual and the realities can sometimes be very different to that. Um, so before we get into all of this, I'd just love to ask you to introduce yourself, give us a little bit of a background on, you know, how you came to start a sustainable perfume line. Thank you, thank you. So yes, I'm Belinda Smith, founder of St. Rose. Um, we just started this collection in October 2019, so a very young brand. Um, really excited though about this kind of place in the industry that we are carving out. So we like to say that we're uncompromising um, and that things have to be good for us and also good for the earth. Um, and we are unisex, so, you know, gents get left out of the clean beauty equation all too often. Um, and it's definitely some, you know, a product that gentlemen enjoy wearing as well. Um, a little bit more about me. I'm originally from Australia. Um, you'll hear my little Aussie accent slip <laughs> in and out every now and then. And it mostly just confuses people. <laughs> okay, well, I've got the American British thing going on too. And nobody, it, it is just what it is. It's like my little Mary Australian twang. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Australia and then moved to the States, um, finished high school over here, moved back to Australia for my undergrad. So I kind of ping ponged across the pond my whole life. Um, and then I found myself um, working for Omega Watches in the luxury space um, right out of college. And that took me from both coasts of the United States and spent a lot of time in New York, which was really fantastic. Um, and then fast forward and it was about, gosh, I would say 2015, I started having a lot of health issues actually. Um, and it was um, most of my gut and not diagnosable. It was so frustrating. And I had one amazing doctor that, you know, started talking more about stress management and environmental factors. And that really took me on this deep dive into clean. I think growing up Aussie, I was already very attuned. You know, my mom cooked organic before organic was a trend. We ate very much farm to table before we even understood that that was like a thing. Um, and beauty it was always very minimalistic, um, but I definitely learned a lot. And I think mostly it's that we're taking for granted that things are being properly tested before they're hitting shelves that then we're buying. Um, oftentimes it's not until there's a complaint from a customer, at least in the US, that we realize that there needs to be uh, post-market testing. Um, and so, you know, I kind of had this deep dive into the beauty space and was doing a lot of just clean swaps on my own. Uh, and fragrance is something that I've always loved, um, kind of been quasi obsessed with and that was something that I couldn't find a replacement for you know everything out there felt like it was not quite as complex or sophisticated um, and it's something that's as old as antiquity you know it's like the ancient Egyptians used to wear perfume so it's like right it's only been within the last 100 years that we've been doing perfume in a very different way with access to you know different synthetic ingredients that can be made in the lab um, so I kind of just dug my heels in and deep dove into this world which is an amazing space to play in I'm, I feel very lucky especially right now during these unusual times it's a great way as you said to create a little uplifting ritual and escapism and something really powerful out of fragrance um but yeah that's kind of how this journey 
came to be. <laughs> so I am so, I'm listening to like, I, I love listening to people like Dr. Mark Hyman and Dr. Zach Bush. And I, I really find this super interesting. And without sounding too personal, I'd love to sort of ask you, you know, when you were going to the doctor, when you were having, cause I think this is a huge thing, mm -hmm. right? Like so wow. many people are going to doctors and they don't know really what's wrong with them. They're just, you know, having general issues and did your doctor mention you know look you know we're putting a lot of things onto our bodies that we shouldn't we're eating things that we shouldn't or i just find it for people that maybe don't have access to that kind of health care it's really helpful and informative to find out what doctors are saying to people when they're looking at things in a little bit more of a holistic way absolutely you know and unfortunately i i think western medicine is fantastic there's a place for it um, but we're really not looking at things holistically and there's so much to learn from Eastern medicine and I eventually went to actually a chiropractor who was really sound in Eastern medicine that started talking to me about you know just mineral deficiencies and why I might not be absorbing things and talking about stress and basically it all comes at least for me and my takeaway from my years of being on this um, is inflammation you know anything anytime there's inflammation anywhere it leads to a lot of uh, unhealth potential disease and so we really want to make sure that we're eliminating inflammation and and with skin being the largest organ on our body and then anything that we do apply at st rose we like to say that anything you put on your skin it's either going to be absorbed or it's going to wash off into the ocean so we have a big responsibility as businesses and also as consumers to really pay attention. Um, and yeah, I would say to answer your question directly, no, I didn't get a lot of that guidance. It was something I kind of was seeking out just out of sheer frustration that I wasn't able to solve this problem. Um, there's always a lot of band-aids that I think get put on things, but it's something really tough to live with when you're feeling lethargic and sluggish and bloated and, you know, having all these scary things going on and, you know, still being, quite young. This started for me when I was about 25. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, you feel at that point that you're like way too young to be having all these health concerns. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, when I've talked to quite a lot of people in the clean space, we have a similar story. It's like this inability to kind of pinpoint exactly what's going on. Um, and as women, you know, we definitely are subject to a lot more chemicals than men. Um, and I did take um, a lot of heart in that. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say that swapping out one thing has solved all my problems. I think that it is very much a holistic outlook that we need to be managing our stress, but we also need to be reducing inflammation anywhere we get the opportunity to. Um, yeah. And well, I think that leads me so nicely into wanting to talk about the issues surrounding perfume and scents and fragrances. And obviously, specifically, we'll talk about perfume, but I know that you kind of mentioned before that fragrances are, are this really big issue too. Um, so I feel like there's a lot to speak to here. So I kind of just wanted to, you know, starting to to talk about it more specifically, when I was kind of researching for this conversation and what I wanted to bring up, I remember having read and I, I found it last night, but um, I started looking into this a few months ago and I was reading on one of the blogs, I kind of one of the holistic blogs I read a lot, um, that scents are full of chemicals now that can lead to symptoms like reduced lung function, respiratory irritation, increased asthma. And this is from the Environmental Working Group saying that when they tested the chemicals in some popular perfumes, they found that on average there were 14 unlisted chemicals in each perfume, some of which are known hormone disruptors and allergens. Others are completely untested for safety in personal care products by the USDA, International Fragrance Association, or any other organization. And it's just, it, you know, sorry, like that's a bit of a mouthful, but I, I think it's important to say that like, there is science behind the fact that, well, what's crazy is there's scientists saying that there's not science behind things that we're putting on our bodies every day. I guess that's really the big point for me. And so how, how did you kind of get into perfume specifically? And when you started deep diving into this, like what did you find in your personal experiences that made you feel like this is something that really needs to be addressed to become a cleaner entity? Yeah, absolutely. So, so again, I guess as a consumer, I was, I was doing this kind of clean beauty swap and on my own kind of health 
priority focus to really, um, you know, both in and out, we need to be nourishing ourselves with really healthy nutrients. And I think we take that for granted a lot that we're not necessarily nourishing our bodies from the outside in. Um, and we absolutely are. And so, you know, as a consumer, I was really looking for a replacement and just wasn't able to find one that still took the box. You know, at the end of the day, I think that we're, we're used to these really beautiful, sophisticated, complex fragrances. And the great thing is that we don't have to sacrifice, but I, um, I know I've heard you speak to this before. There's, there's that stigma that um, sustainable can be, you know, granola and, um, you know, you don't, you can't find the, the same um, sophistication. And, and I guess I was kind of hitting that a little bit myself and was just stubborn enough to say, okay, well, there doesn't have to be just because it's not here on the market yet. Yeah. You know, I was really curious about diving in, but from the brand journey and as a founder, I was actually also really curious about the health of the earth, actually. You know, there was all these beautiful aromatic notes on the back of, of perfume packaging. And I was really curious, okay, whose hands have touched this, knowing that it takes, you know, like 100,000 pounds of rose petals to create a little pound of rose essential oils. We know it can be a really taxing um, industry on the environment as, you know, beauty is in general. Um, we can talk about the end of life of product packaging later on. Um, and so I was really just curious and wasn't able to turn up with any answers. And I think for me, starting St. Rose and realizing, okay, both as a consumer, I'm finding this. And then I'm also identifying on the sustainability conversation side, the health of the earth. This isn't really being talked in the, enough and it should be. Um, and so, you know, I started working with some incredible people in the industry from my time being in the, the retail space. I had some great contacts um, and just started really diving in and doing the research. Um, and gosh, okay, so keep me on track here because there's so much. <laughs> this is a very, it's actually a very political conversation too, you know, because the industry, the fragrance industry is a beautiful one. And that's really composed of artists, you know, that are behind these perfumes. And they definitely are not creating anything, you know, knowingly that there's, there, there's chemicals in here that are being flagged for being endocrine disruptors. The tough thing is, is that it's been 80 years since the US, I'll speak to the US market specifically, that the FDA has made any type of updates in regulation or has done a, you know, big update on banning chemicals. So there's these new synthetic, um, you know, and speaking to fragrance specifically, aromatic materials being made every year, and they aren't necessarily being vetted by a governing body. You do have IFRA, mm -hmm. and um, the fragrance industry is very self-regulated, which is fantastic. Um, but I think what it comes down to is also the 1973 Fair Labeling Act. Um, that allowed fragrance brands to just merely, and actually not even just fragrance brands, you know, you think about anything that is scented. So it could be laundry detergent, laundry sheets, um, any household cleaning products. You can look at the back of them and it'll have fragrance. And that is a placeholder for a lot of different ingredients. And the reason is, is that it provided, um, you know, these proprietary formulas to be kept as a trade secret. And that's great. It's pretty unnecessary today because there's these machines that'll actually break it all down for us and let us know what's in it. Um, but you know, a lot of brands are still holding on to that. And to be kind to the industry, you know, I really don't think anyone. And going back to you know how beautiful it is and that there's these incredible artists. No one is creating anything to knowingly cause any harm. Um, and it's really horrible that we are finding these tests. I actually hadn't heard that particular quote from EWG, but there's plenty of information out there. Um, you know, even Johnson & Johnson just finally recalled baby powder that's been used for decades, you know, with um, these potential things that we're using that seemingly are safe, but they just haven't done enough due diligence. And, and I think that that really comes down to consumers and companies pushing for better consumer safety laws. And I think that that's coming. And I also think that, you know, this 1973 Fair Labeling Act, while it's fantastic that it protects 
formulas, it, it is a little unnecessary. And we can go about transparency in a smart way that allows a consumer to know what's in it and also protects the brands the way St. Rose does it because we're very focused on transparency. It's really why I started this whole journey is that I just wanted to know and couldn't find the answers is that we list everything alphabetically um, based off of concentration down to 0.01%, you know? And I think that that is really important because there's a lot of, you know, kind of naysayers that it's like, we're not doing anything that would cause any harm. Absolutely, they're not. You know, going back to IFRA, everything is self-regulated to the point where um, there's concentration levels that certain ingredients, even naturals, and I'll get back to that in a minute, that it can only be at such and such a percentage. The problem is, is that women in particular use up to 12 different products before she even leaves the house. You think about shampoo, body wash, conditioner, um, hairspray, foundation, lipstick, mm -hmm. um, nail polish. We're exposing ourselves to so many different ingredients, but it's about a, um, a cumulative level. Mm -hmm. And then you take that across an entire week a month, a year, a lifetime, and we're exposing ourselves to a lot of ingredients. So while that one product might have, you know, everything below, way below a safe limit, mm -hmm. when you're looking at the entire beauty shelf, and you know, it's the day and age of the beauty shelfie, right? We love a good shelfie, yeah. but you can just yeah. see it, all the products that we have um, that we're exposing ourselves to. And so that is what is important. It's not necessarily the swiping on your favorite lipstick that isn't necessarily in the clean categories is not going to make you sick. It's just something that you need to be thinking about again for this potential of inflammation or allergens um, that are definitely on the rise that it's an accumulative story. And I think that that's what we need to be focusing on. Yeah. And you mentioned endocrine disruptors. And I think for like people that don't necessarily know what that is, can you just, can you just explain a little bit what that is and, and why we're finding those in, in fragrances specifically? Yeah. And definitely keep me back on track because there's so much to talk about here and it is so, and I'm trying to be as educating as possible because I think that's what is the most important thing. Fragrance in particular, and I will always stand up for the industry because it's so beautiful and so nostalgic. And I think it would be such a shame for something that um, somebody's been wearing their whole life or that reminds them of their grandmother or that what their mom used to wear when they were little, that suddenly they associate with something unsafe. It's not necessarily the case. It's the fact that I think as humans, we do want to know, we're innately curious. And this labeling act has allowed fragrance to be a placeholder for a lot of unknown ingredients that are in formulas. And so I think there's that reluctance, there's a fear of the unknown, but we shouldn't be looking at fragrance on a label as a scary word. We should just be reaching out very much like what the fashion industry has done, especially post Rana Plaza collapse, saying who's, what's in this? Just like with the, with the, um, clothing and apparel, asking, you know, where are my clothing, where is it coming from, who's making it. So same thing, I think that we can be, as consumers, reaching out to these companies, and if they're not providing the answers, then you can make your decision at that point. But um, yes, in your research that you did with EWG, there's a lot of stories like that, and there's, you know, we know in the clean beauty space, there's a lot of free from comments being thrown out there. Mm -hmm. um, those are the big, you know, you talk about like the dirty dozen um, or the toxic 20. Um, it's phylates, parabens, um, sulfates. Sulfates really aren't in fragrance. They might be in a fragranced product like hand soap. So sulfates are something that makes things foam up. Um, phylates are, you know, basically plasticizers that will actually, in fragrance in particular, um, have it hold on to the skin longer. Mm -hmm. It's also in fertilizer. It's what makes fertilizer stick to the ground. So oh. why would we want to be putting that on our bodies? I don't know, but it does, you know, phthalates make things last longer. So it's in hairspray to get things to hold. Um, so absolutely, that's something that we do not want on our bodies. Those are known endocrine disruptors. They are also very um, inflammatory. So it can cause a lot of just dermal issues and, and allergic reactions. Um, parabens is another one um, that's preservative. Um, other ingredients that we make sure that are not in our fragrances are BHT and phenoxyethanol. Both are, BHT is basically a cocktail of chemicals that act as a stabilizer to get a longer shelf life. 
um, I like to look at fragrance as fine wine. You know, it's there to be enjoyed. We should be allowing ourselves to spray on our perfume and not just saving it for a special occasion. It's so amazingly uplifting. If you are a bit of a wardrobe or a fragrance, you just simply keep it in a cool, dry space. And you know, I, I don't think that you're going to need any type of unnecessarily ingredient to preserve it for years and years and years. You know, that's silly. Um, I think that going to goes hand in hand in the consumer problem that we're having of overconsumption anyway, really, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, people have different like perfumes to go out, different perfumes to stay, you know, and there's all these yeah. things. And like you said, it's not that we shouldn't be enjoying those things, but maybe choosing something that has a shorter shelf life, going through it, and then choosing a new scent or revisiting that scent if you loved it. You know, it, it's just about being a little bit more conscientious and maybe not so, you know, I'm going to have mm -hmm. eight things on the go and hope that they last for five years because I just feel like wanting it, you know, at any different occasion. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it definitely, it, it is a wider um, beauty conversation because, you know, it's, I think fragrance again is getting a little bit of a bad rap just because of that 1973 Fair Labeling Act that yeah. people are really freaked out by the fact that fragrance has been a placeholder for so long. Um, but I think that, you know, we need to strip that back and, you know, start asking questions of brands like, you know, anybody else out there is not listing St. Rose's. There's a number of us that are. Um, but if you're in love with suppling and they're not being transparent, I think that you can reach out to the brand and, and ask them. Yeah. Um, and also just start educating yourself on what these ingredients mean. And so you have to go back, you know, phthalates, parabens, sulfates are definitely the, the no-nos. There's also, again, uh, phenoxyethanol, which is a preservative. Um, BHT, which is a stabilizing cocktail. Um, there's artificial colorants a lot in fragrance. So when you look at, um, you know, you just go through a shopping center for a loud back or you go online and things are wild colors like blue or pink and things um, that, that is not something necessarily that is, I don't think needed. That's my personal opinion. Um, I don't like to spray on anything on my skin that's an unnecessary um, element, uh, I guess, teach their own. Some people think it looks really pretty and that's why they're doing it. Um, our products are actually naturally dyed. So you'll see that if you go to strose.com or, you know, you're, you're physically in front of our product, um, Gypsy Cowboy is definitely the darkest hue in our collection. And that's because of all the beautiful pink peppercorn and ginger and spice notes that are naturally pigmenting um, the juice inside, which I just think is so cool. Again, I feel like working with naturals especially is, is so amazing. I think Mother Nature does it best. And so we definitely, you know, work on that philosophy. Um, other ingredients specifically in fragrance that I personally would avoid and that we have as a brand um, is nitro musks and poly and alicetic musks. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, such bad names. It's just like, I feel like if we actually ever looked on the back of things, I think that's just the big thing is oftentimes we don't because I, I feel like this would make you pause if you were genuinely looking at something and you were seeing all this. Yes. And it's so, I mean, it's so crazy, like the amount of like, my poor husband actually keeps walking out the door. So if you're hearing background noise, I have a little puppy <laughs> around me and my husband's in and out of the house. We're in my in-laws right now. Um, and so um, I, I spent like my first wedding anniversary, bless his heart for allowing me to do this. I had just gotten the compositional breakdown from my fragrance house, which is novel typically you know as a brand you don't get that and that was part of my requirement of working with this particular fragrance house is that they would provide me the full compositional breakdown so that then i could share that with our customers um, and so you know even though they knew all my creative parameters they knew that this is the no list this is the yes list of what we're able to work with i still personally just was curious and wanted to educate myself so i spent like an entire 48 hours um googling every single um, ingredients and diving in, highlighting ones that I couldn't find and then talking to friends that are, you know, organic company chemists and figuring out, you know, my own take. And I think that is probably overkill. And we hope, and I think what we're taking for granted is that every brand is doing that or that there's governing bodies that are taking the due diligence and there's not necessarily that happening. 
Um, and again, I think that, you know, these um, IFRA, which is the International Fragrance Research Association, um, they are looking at it on a per product level for the most mm -hmm. part, not necessarily looking at it as to what you know, again, throwing women under the bus, what your average woman is going to be adding that on with, you know, so she's layering all these other different ingredients that might have an equally high percentage under the safe threshold of yeah. X ingredient that, you know, over a lifetime, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily want to put on your own body or your mom to put on her skin or your daughter what have you. So yeah. it's like, it's like this idea of, you know, if you're, eating mostly organic and then once in a while you have a cheat meal it's fine but if you're constantly eating fast food you know pesticide filled you know it, that will eventually catch up with you I, I think that's so much the same with with beauty and I feel like you made a really good point in that we expect brands to be doing that and all these people behind all of these big brands and I think also oftentimes something I find when I'm speaking to my friends or my family is that people assume that if something is, is luxury or in the luxury sphere, particularly then they're doing it. And I think it's important to break down that oftentimes, you know, I don't want to name names, but a very expensive brand isn't spending any more time looking into their chemical composition than, you know, a, a really household name brand. And it's probably based off of what you were saying and that like, they're not thinking or trying to do anything wrong, but when they're producing things like that for them, it's probably like, it needs to smell a certain way. It needs to look a certain way. It needs to last a certain amount of time. And then we're just going to slap a really expensive price tag on it and people are going to want it. And I, I feel like, I hope that like these days are kind of coming to an end because as you say, yeah. as consumers, we're becoming more inquisitive and asking these questions. And it doesn't matter if it's a 300 pound bottle of perfume or a 50 pound bottle of perfume. We all kind of want to know what's going on behind the scenes now. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, I, I truly, you know, I, I love the industry I'm in. I know where a lot of amazing brands are manufacturing and knowing the people that work there, they have strong, even internal regulatory teams. Um, you know, I would, be, I think, in the space of greenwashing, if I were to say you should be really fearful about what you're putting on your skin. No, I don't think that people need to be, um, especially if you're somebody that's looking at swapping everything over. Don't throw away what you're using. You know, I mean, I tell a lot of people just spray it on your scarf if you're that fearful. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we need to be. I think what we need to be doing, very similar to, again, you know, <clears throat> five years ago, what really kicked off with the, the fashion revolution um, is who made my clothes is what's in this, you know, as consumers, we should really be pushing um, even before there's these new regulations that hopefully will be coming for being transparent. Um, and I, I think that transparency really needs to go further into sourcing as well um, and, and how we are taking care of the earth and each other in, in making products, um, especially in beauty, because that's really not being talked about enough. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there's, there are ingredients that to, to look out for and to make sure that you're, you're not using, um, but you can educate yourself on them. Again, reach out to brands and, and just make sure that they're not in what you're using. And hopefully soon, I think it's really difficult to knowing how hard it was for us to start with transparency. I think it would be 10,000 times harder for a brand to go backwards and start being transparent. I wish them all luck and hopefully we'll all get there. <laughs> um, but then to answer your other question, because I think it is important. So musks, musks used to be, they are, you know, a, a class of aroma molecules that um, used to all come naturally from animals. Okay. So they were like the anal secretions of the musk deer, for, for instance. And so since about, I think the eighties, that hasn't been happening because, you know, you have pitas and that's kind of gross anyway. Um, so luckily PETA put an end to that for all of us. But um, since then, musk has been produced in labs and there are um, a number of different class, different categories of musk that are safer than others. So we only work with macrocyclic musks, and that's basically just the chemical structure 
So, um, you know, everything, even in our bodies, is made up of molecules. And so we shouldn't necessarily be more scared of things that are made in a lab um, than nature. I think nature for everybody is a little bit more um, understandable, you know, yeah. if it's readily available, that's the way it was intended to be, you know, things when we're getting involved, it's just a question mark. And that's understandable. It's definitely how I feel as well. But um, that's not always the case. It's just looking at things again in our lens is that it needs to be good for you, good for the earth. So polycyclic, allycyclic masks are typically safe for humans, but they pose a bioaccumulative concern in nature. And so we don't use those. Nitrocyclic masks have been shown to be endocrine disruptors. And so we definitely want to avoid those. So it's a definitely um, a very complex area. And I think what needs to happen is that more and more research and regulation needs to be built up around this. And then in lieu of that, I think the onus is on brands educating consumers and consumers educating themselves. Um, so I'm always so thrilled to have this conversation. <laughs> and so ask me questions because I know I probably just poured out a lot of info. But <laughs> no, I think it's so important because I think that the time is now coming where we're thinking about what we're putting on our skin every single day. And that's so important. But I do want to get into this, you know, I, I do want to get into this conversation that I think is so important because you guys talk about sustainability as much as you do sort of wellness and cleanness and all of these things that we've kind of established why we should be doing. But I don't think we often think of what the environmental impact is of, say, producing synthetic fragrances or things like that. And you were kind of mentioning before we got on, like, you know, just people dumping, you know, perfumes and stuff that you can, you can explain this more. But I think what happens when we produce beauty that's maybe a little bit toxic not just to us but where does that go in the environment like how does that affect things when we're producing these more lab-based less natural scents and formulations because that I, I think we can't talk about wellness and our own health without talking about the environment and the state of the planet so you know what what's the deal with that basically <laughs> <laughs> loaded question I'm sure no, oh, no, no. I love it. Cause I, you know, I really do think, and I'm an, I'm an ever optimist that, you know, people have the right intentions. People are going to be wanting to take care of our own health. Um, but I don't necessarily know if we're paying enough attention as we should. Um, I do think it's coming, um, to how all of production impacts, um, the planet that we live on. And we all take from nature every single day and we need to make sure that we're giving back. And, um, I have been so passionate about that from day one. So truly deciding to work with more naturals, our products under the ISO um, standard language 9235, our fragrances are all well over 95% natural. We say that wiggle room for vegan musk um, that is all vetted against, you know, EWG, um, made safe, made, you know, a ton of different research to make sure that it's all safe for us and safe for the earth. Working with naturals can actually be at odds with the environment. So it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive, but it just actually, to me, I like a challenge <laughs> and I just want to make sure yeah. um, that we can work in harmony with the earth. And we absolutely can. Um, there's some incredible things that are happening. One of my favorite stories is our sandalwood in Western Australia um, that have become gorgeous friends that I am so thankful for. They're part of the best thing that's come out of this journey for me um, because they have taught me so much. But I, when I was starting St. Rose, sandalwood is one of my favorite notes to work with. Um, and I was doing a lot of research, realized that the origins of sandalwood were mostly um, from India. And in India, sandalwood's basically considered an endangered species now. It's been so over harvested. Oh, cool. um, and there, that happens quite a lot. You know, we're, we're taxing things too often, and especially in countries where there's might not be as strong environmental regulations on things. Mm -hmm. um, so then I turned 
and found that um, Australia, which is where I'm from, so I was very proud of this, is the most sustainable source in the world for sandwood, which was so amazing. And I was finding um, a few different farms that were beautiful and I stumbled across Dutch and sandalwood oils in Western Australia and I just absolutely adore them and what they're doing is so amazing. They're working in a 50-50 partnership with the First Nations people of Australia mm. who are, you know, the native title holders of the land that we are really lucky to have some of our sandalwood oil come from. So they have a plantation side that's owned by more of the business and then they have um, the the native land where there's this beautiful you know oil that's coming from trees that are over 100 years old but they're being harvested in a way that um i, I believe they call it a deadwood process so anytime a piece of bark a branch falls off of a tree they're harvesting it that way or if they're noticing and i think that this comes down to indigenous knowledge you know they these cultures are over sixty thousand years old and tending to the land, living in harmony has been passed on for generations. Um, and so it's just really incredible that level of knowledge um, to be able to make sure that they are harvesting in a way that's going to leave these trees really healthy. Um, and so then we, we have our own little proprietary blend at St. Rose of what that blend is from the virgin side to um, the deadwood side. Um, and the, the plantation side is already doing an, an amazing amount of good. A lot of this land um, was originally just mowed down for cattle grazing and things. And so having the plantation side there is, is also a, a lot of environmental good. You know, these nitrogen rich trees are invigorating the soil again, which is fantastic. Um, and they just won the United Nations Equator Prize um, for this really cool model that's both this environmental amazing story and then having this incredible socioeconomic impact um, on the local community. Yeah, and I think that that's just, you know, the ultimate example of a sustainable sourcing um, and you know definitely a good pillar for other businesses to follow suit of how we can you know work in harmony not just with nature but then also looking at other cultures and communities and how we can really in a 50 50 partnership work yeah. together yeah because I think that sometimes with you know fashion there's this great sort of um, ability to really think about who's making your clothes because it seems like this process where you know somebody would have had to stitch it or we it or, or whatever but sometimes beauty can almost seem a little bit like over there like not really something that's been touched I think you kind of think of it as being manufactured without that much human input and it's it's really crazy when you think about it because that's not the case at all no you know not at all it's and even our our fragrances are hand compounded so you know literally we have a compounder that walks up and picks the oil off of the shelf and picks this other oil off the shelf and it's a handmade amazing art which is um, I, I love fragrance I love this industry and um, I'm so happy to be able to talk to you about it and hopefully reassure people um, a lot about even in the more traditional space about what they're they're wearing but um, I really hope that all industries and especially fragrance starts focusing more on sustainability and there are you know, incredible companies that we can um, call upon that are already doing an awful lot of good. Conservation International is another group that we work with that, um, you know, is actively putting us in touch with and already has relationships with um, ingredients mm -hmm. throughout the world. Um, you know, there's there's incredible projects in the works. Our vetiver comes from Haiti, which is um, a fair trade cooperative with the women there. Um, all of our citrus comes from a fifth, um, generation family owned business in Calabria, Italy. And, you know, it's, it's really incredible what all of these farmers are doing in very different areas. Um, again, working with naturals is so incredible because these ingredients, I think, really tell a story yeah. and they really are very rich and alive with um, being nourished by the ground where they are from, which, you know, you take um, a sandalwood tree in the Western desert of Australia and then pair it against, you know, a, a bergamot tree and an orchard in Calabria, Italy. And it just adds this to me, this beautiful, very dreamy 
sophistication um, that's really fun to play to play in. Okay. Well, I mean, the scents are amazing, and I I feel really really lucky to have been able to try them, and I'm I'm excited for everybody listening to be able to do as well. But you know, I think something else I wanted you to just chat about briefly is this idea. So we are always so happy when our designers are part of things like One Percent for the Planet, which you are because it's just this very you know, and what I what I always find so interesting is that all of these small new designers that I'm lucky and privileged to work with at Rev are are more a part of those things than like a lot of the bigger brands that I look to to see how they're doing. So it, I feel like first of all, like applause to you for you know doing that right off the get go. Um, but can you can you talk a little bit about that partnership and why it was important to you and and you know sort of how it, how it's helped dictate some of maybe the decisions you've made or I don't know because I just think it's such an amazing organization. I love I love it. I I think it's so fantastic. They, they are amazing. Um, they've done of course the founders of Patagonia are who started it, and I think that you know um, it's really just encouraging you know i think that we can look at sustainability and be daunted by it and i just love that there are so many really incredible groups out there and individuals and businesses that are saying no actually if we all just rally together look at what incredible good we can we can do so yeah um from day one you know obviously we're very passionate about the environment doing all we can um to make sure that our sourcing is appropriate, but I, to me, I still feel like, you know, we are still taking from the earth. And so ultimately we want to be giving back as well. And yeah. so 1% for the planet, I think is just the premier place to go to, to be able to then partner with conservation groups. Yeah. So being 1% for the planet business member, you're basically just making a contractual commitment that part of your profits are going to go back to conservation efforts. And then within the umbrella of 1%, there are also conservation partners that then, you know, it's almost like a dating site, really, <laughs> is that you get grouped up with a conservation partner. Um, and so, you know, I was chatting with the group 1% for the planet when I started and let them know, you know, really areas that I'm really passionate in. Um, and for me, it's been planting trees. Um, I think it was uh, actually it was a write-up from NASA that I loved. Um, I, I, it's probably like a ten-year-old report now, but um, about how looking at carbon dioxide as really the Earth's thermostat, and that really stuck with me. Okay, so if we can do anything to really mitigate global warming, it's reducing our emissions and also doing something to um, alleviate the amount of CO2 in, in the atmosphere and tree planting has definitely been top of mind in a big conversation and doing it really well too. You know, you can't just go out and plant a tree and think that you're doing amazing. It has to be the right one. It has to be in harmony with that particular ecosystem where you're planting it. Um, and so they um, have put us in touch with a number of groups, which we, you know, will likely be partnering in addition to Wild Ark, who is our Australian conservation group. I shouldn't say that they're just Australian. They started in Australia, but they're actually international. They do a lot of work in Africa as well as Alaska. Um, they're an amazing conservation partner that we're really lucky to align with. Um, they have actually invested, I think it was three years and a ton of money into working with the top scientists in the world to identify key areas. So if you go to wildark.org, I believe, um, you can see this report that they have invested the time to understand, okay, where, if we were to go and do anything, would be the biggest impact that would have the most as, as far as you know the biodiversity in the earth that this area is supporting and so they came up with the 100 hot spots so to speak of that can do the most um environmental good and so for me as a young brand i was like well that's amazing because you know hopefully we'll grow into a huge company that has really deep pockets but right now what we are able to contribute you know we just want to make sure that it's really going to make a big splash and so really excited about all the work that they are doing um, when it comes to trees uh they are actually um going to be in new south wales where our first planting um, journeys taking place in September. So they're planting 4,800 native trees to reforest the area in New South Wales that was 
really affected by the horrible fires this year. Um, yeah, so hopefully that'll do. Oh yeah, sorry. No, sorry to interrupt you. It's just funny because I had Sammy from Bear on and we talked about this, um, you know, specifically, it was so, heartbreaking at the start of this year. I mean, 2020 has now become an entirely heartbreaking year. So it's very hard to remember that it was only a few months ago that we were watching yeah. you know, the coverage of these forest fires and the devastation of the local people, the wildlife, the ecosystems. Yeah. And I guess, you know, it's something that I asked Sammy and I, I want to ask you too, you know, to people that maybe are thinking about starting a new brand, starting a new business, maybe COVID has given them time to reflect that maybe they'd like to do something different with their lives. You know, how did you, how did you decide that if you were going to start a business, it had to be sustainable and has it been more difficult to do it this way? And, you know, or is it just worth it? And we intrinsically need to be starting brands that are sustainable for starting anything now. I guess it's sort of like hearing from people that are doing it, what your, what your thoughts on this are. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Like why, why would we start anything if it's not going to be in harmony with, with the earth and like, you know, there's, we're in such a critical time. I think it would be just very, um, naive and foolish to to be looking at anything even from the viability of the business because i think consumers are so switched on so you know even if you didn't necessarily care your consumers are going to care an awful lot so um it's very very important i don't think it's worth it to start anything and um it's it's incredibly difficult you know so i definitely can also say that with um a, a level of actually a very deep level of understanding of how hard it is um, as a young brand, um, especially if you're not, you know, have a huge amount of, of financial backing behind you and you're just going little by little. But I think it's better to start small and slowly. Um, and I, I also feel like that is in, in alignment with sustainability anyway from we don't need a whole bunch of excess. Um, start really small and do what you can. Do it really well where it comes to the right packaging. Um, when you're looking at a consumer goods product, we are definitely limited to availability of um, packaging that's readily available. Doing anything custom takes an awful lot of money. You know, so even for St. Rose, um, we have beautiful glass bottles and caps that come from Nice, France. Um, and already I'm, I'm wishing that I was able to have started right away with doing more recyclable options. So everything that we use is recyclable but it has to be properly disassembled, you know? And so I already want to um, get to a level very quickly that we're able to look at our packaging to have it be, you know, easily disassembled. Right now we're asking consumers to send things back to us and then get a kickback for, you know, being involved in the recycling process. Um, but I think that, you know, it's an important Thing to start with what you can um, offset where you can <laughs> um, as far as working you know with carbon neutral um, and then giving back as well um, and and just looking at I think every area it is a bit exhausting there's a lot to do and a lot more work to do but I do think it is really really important well, I think I couldn't agree more and um, I'm right there with you. And, you know, final, final question from me, because I think it's a really nice one to lead on from what you just were speaking about. But I kind of always love asking people this, you know, I, I feel like personally, you know, I started Rev a few years ago now and I, my background was sustainability already, but like it's driven me to go so much further in my own personal life in terms of how I live and the conscious lifestyle that I'm kind of curating. And how do you feel like you personally have changed since starting this journey? Like, do you feel like it's pushed you further in terms of the way that you live your life? Your husband lives his life. You know, I just think people are so curious about what's going on behind the scenes. So I love, I love that sort of information. Yeah, you know, um, especially in fragrance, it's, it's been such a gift. Um, you know, I've learned so much more about slowing down. Um, and, and I think because it's inherently more difficult to do things the right way and to have that extra challenge of 
being good for you and also good for the earth. You know, there's a lot more research, a lot more vetting, um, but there's not that silly feeling of rushing to the finish line. Of course, like we need to, you know, we're a business, you know, we're wanting um, to promote ourselves and put ourselves out there. But I think that um, it's just a slower approach. Um, you know, fragrance takes being handmade and then it has to macerate. It's a slow art. And so I think learning patience and just finding that beauty in the slowdown, we're all being forced to slow down right now in 2020. It seems like mother nature is making us kind of pause and reflect on everything. <laughs> but I think that, that that's it. And, you know, I had mentioned how um, my friends at Dapjan have been such a gift to me. The, you know, Aboriginal community, um, the Martu people have considered sandalwood to be sacred. Um, for 60,000 years, they've been using it in ceremony and in ritual, and they believe that the smoke of sandalwood will protect them. Um, it aids in reducing stress and opening up the third eye. And that's such a lovely addition. You know, pre this, I didn't really think about wearing fragrance that way and pausing as I'm spraying it on. Um, but I think, you know, in, in all realms, I've been a lot more thoughtful of I think I already was thoughtful as a consumer, but it's it's made me pause even more and really appreciate other brands that are equally as, um, you know, just strict in, in how that they are um, working and really appreciating everything that they're doing as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, less is more and choosing better, all things that we've all been saying for a really long time, but it definitely, one year, when you're the one making something and realizing just how complex it is to create, it makes you really appreciate all these beautiful artisans all over the world and what they're doing. Well, I think that's a beautiful answer. So thank you so much, Belinda. And I, I'm so excited to bring St. Rose on to Rev. I thank you. I'm so excited to partner with you and thank you for inviting me on. I feel very honored to be here and chatting with you about all of this. It's a huge topic. So please feel free to reach out if you have more questions. It's, um, we kind of just scratched the surface on a lot of issues. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much and we'll speak soon. All right, great.